hello there welcome back to the agostino zinger show episode number 164 with me your host agostino zinger what's going on Ugh, glasses on feeling good what's happening how you feeling how's life huh hope you're doing well hope you're doing bloody well because i am look how sunny it is out there good morning um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be watching or listening to this dear old podcast, wherever you are. Um, it's now sometime in the morning before I head off to work. I'm just trying to get this podcast in, get a little breakfast in, and then I'm going to zip out. But before we do that, we got to talk about some things that happened this week that were of interest to me, right? Isn't it? Huh? Huh? That's what podcasts are for. Ranting, raving, talking about stuff that interests you, and hopefully sharing them with the wider public. But before we get into that, I'd want to um, extend my um, condolences um, to Brody Stevens, um, the well-known comedian, uh, American-based comedian, um, who was uh, always around the comedy store, Laugh Factory, and all those other spots. If you've ever been to LA and you've popped into some of those comedy stores, you've definitely seen him doing some, you know, some quite brilliant crowd work. Um, he was very well regarded amongst the comedian, amongst the comedy circuit. Um, I think he was much more of a com a comedian's com a comedian's comedian, right? Um, he had a real cult following online. Um, some of his best stuff you might have seen on podcasts such as Kill Tony, where he's kind of you know he's really good at you know just riffing off the cuff and stuff. And um, I recommend you check out some of his specials. But unfortunately, over the weekend, uh, he passed away. Um, and took his own life in very drastic circumstances and. I guess it's just another wake up call um in terms of people understanding the severity of um, mental health. I think um I've been one to say or it's been something that's kind of really bugged me a lot over the last recent years or last decade or so um with the prevalence of social media and the prevalence of like YouTube stars where a lot of people who are battling, you know, who are really finding it hard to balance um this need to kind of feed the beast when it comes to social media and kind of keep your relevancy and to make sure people know who you are. And this also, this idea that you you are two different people, right, online and, uh, and offline. And I think some people have come to the wrong conclusion that because of the stress and the turmoil it causes them day by day, that that is somehow um, indicative of a mental health issue. And I don't think it is. I think people are cheapening the term mental health issues when they're associating it with the fact that they have to post on social media accounts two times a day because they're an influencer. I don't think that is a mental health issue. I think that's an issue of the platform that's maybe an, an uh, an error that's maybe uh, a level of expectancy that you've you've kind of um, given to your fans and to your users that use that platform but i don't think it's indicative of actual mental health issue i think a mental health issue runs far deeper i think when you look at somebody like a brody stevens who recently passed away and someone like an anthony bourdain who recently passed away on paper for most people out there especially for men um they are, you know, your quintessential, they have the quintessentially the perfect life, right? They have the perfect jobs, right? They're doing the one thing that everyone would wish they'd want to do, right? In Brody Stevens' case, he goes up on stage and tells dick, joke, tells dick jokes for a living, right? Um, he gets to earn a living by making people laugh on stage, right? I don't know how many times he goes up um, during a week doing a short set and getting paid handsomely for it. On top of that, he might do some writing for certain TV shows. He might do some production work. So essentially, he's living the life of a, a real creative artist. And on the Anthony Bourdain side, he gets to travel the world, meet new and interesting people, eating at the best restaurants, drinking and having fun. Right. That's what he gets to do. And he gets to present it in a really authentic way through the medium of a television show. So on paper, these two guys are living the best life, are living their, you know, their best life, are living what we deem to be the perfect life. But then they still feel like it's not enough. They still feel like their life isn't worth living and they take it away. And I think that's what real mental health is, right? That's the mental health issue that we really have to come to grips with. I think the idea that, you know, you're finding it hard to balance your social media life with your real life is one thing. You know, you just have, you just put your phone down. You don't have the same demands that Brody D. Stevens or Anthony Bourdain does in, in terms of how much the, how much of their presence people need, right? The extraction of their value. I don't think the average everyday person has that kind of problem. I still think it's an issue. I still think we probably spend too much time on these social media platforms, especially not using them as tools, but using them as um, distraction techniques. And I think that's where it kind of gets us in trouble. I think if you replace social media with alcohol, with drugs, or with um, excessive partying, 
you'd find the same issue too, right? You're you're kind of ignoring the actual issue that's at hand. The issue is that you're not happy with your situation and you're trying to numb the pain by overindulging on these things on the outside, whether it's scrolling, whether it's um, doing drugs, whether it's drinking. So I think getting those things in balance is what makes things better. But of course, you know, we've all got a phone in our hand. Um, it's not like drugs, drugs or alcohol. You don't need to pay for anything. The apps are free. So it's really easy to kind of get involved. It's to kind of get in, into that vortex and kind of spiral out of control. But again, I'm really hopeful that in the next few years, there are some advancements in technology, in medicine, where we're able to kind of um, find out if depression or mental health issues like this are a chemical, are due to a chemical imbalance, whether there's something that's hereditary, that gets passed down, whether there's something that can be medicated adequately enough. Because, you know, with Brody Stevens' case, the, the story goes that he was he was self-medicating. He came off the meds. Then he went back on the meds because he wanted to, he felt like he was kind of um, getting off the rails. But um, regardless of what happened, um, I just want to remember the great um, Brody Stevens, a really influential comic, um, someone that really inspired me, someone who I was a big fan of, somebody who I was always looking forward to, to hear and listen to when he come on podcasts and somebody who I hope his memory um, will live long in people's minds, man. So um, RIP Brody Stevens um, and my thoughts and feelings go out to everyone um, that knows him, um, close family and friends, man. It's been a bit of a bummer, bummery week, to be honest, hearing that kind of news. And again, it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because um, you don't, I don't know these people personally, right? Um, I've never met them. I might have seen them on stage perform at the comedy store or Laugh Factory or something. But I guess the beauty of podcasts is that the fact that you hear somebody speaking like for an hour a week or whatever it may be, right? Sometimes even more so they speak to your own family. You sometimes feel as if like you know the person, especially when it's in like a loose format such as this, right? Where you're not really, you don't really have an agenda. You don't really have a, you don't have themes or topics you want to talk about. You're just shooting the shit. That's what most comedians do. They get into a room and they just kind of shoot the shit and see where the com conversation goes. And Brody Stevens was one of the best at doing that, really, at holding court in a room with people, right? And making them all, uh, you know, kneel over, die, kneel over laughing in fucking pain. Um, and it's going to be a shame not to have him around anymore, man. But yeah, I hope his memory lives on for those fans out there. Um, but yeah, all right, people, Brody Stevens, man. Moving on, uh, what else do we have here? All right, so um, who are who are how are how are how are how are how are how do you say that? You say how are or how are how are how are how are. So how are that 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 brand right? Who or whenever that, that fuck it's I think it's a Chinese brand. I'm pretty sure. Um, they've gone about and made a foldable phone, right? That's what they've gone about and done. And I'm, I still don't understand what's going on with these foldable phones. Am I the only one that's a bit confused? Um, why do people want foldable phones? Can someone tell me this? Um. Is this going to appeal to like the the, the African uncle um, that has like a massive Bluetooth piece and carries around a tablet everywhere he goes, or a big the biggest smartphone he can find? Is that what it is? Is it because most people want? Um, is it because most people don't use laptops and they usually have desktop computers they will use at work, so they use that like, the tablet as like their go-to kind of um, computing device? Um, is it because people want the bigger screen to see more shit? Um, what is it about foldable phones that's so um, alluring to people? Especially um, nowadays where most people are wearing, I don't know, quite slim-fitting, form-fitting clothes. Um, it's already hard enough having to put um, uh, a big iPhone in your pocket, right? Um, nowadays, a lot of guys are carrying around satchels or side bags or uh, fanny packs or whatever they may be to put their um, smartphones in. But there must come a time when that's going to be a bit cumbersome right it's gonna be a bit bothersome that every day you go out and you have to have some sort of bag um slung to the side of your um waist in order to carry your fucking electronics it's a bit annoying no or is it just me i don't know i just i just don't understand what what, what the what the what the law is of this foldable phone but um this phone i saw featured on verge is here on the screen let me get it up on there um so this is hawaii has the best is that you pronounce it hawaii or hairy i don't know how you pronounce this um has the um the best first draft for a foldable phone um again it looks cool i guess for the most part but i just don't know what their law is i don't see why people want this thing um let's get a bit of the video up here and see why people would want it let's get this off the screen so i can put the sound on but um yeah it's just strange right like i've always i think when i was younger and smart or phones were kind of um you know they were iterating out and you were getting so many new developments every see every kind of year it seemed like with phones 
it seemed like we always wanted we all wanted kind of littler phones right so they can slide into our pockets right i think of a nokia 8230 then the iphone comes around and it was still fairly small right the original iphone it wasn't like a big behemoth of a thing then little by little we slowly started to accept that we want bigger and bigger phones and i think partly in partly due to people um taking their phones on their commute and like you know using them to kind of watch uh, movies or listen to mu- music whatever it may be so you want them as like um your main kind of entertainment portal i kind of get that um and then maybe with the fact that most laptops i think the the gap between laptops is, is it shrinks would you say i think you would i say you've got a macbook from apple right at the top end then you've got maybe some windows laptops maybe uh just underneath that and then you've got the Chromebooks and stuff, which are varying kind of price ranges, right? You can get Chromebooks that are as expensive as a, as a MacBook. Um, but for the most part, people can get a laptop if they want one, even a notebook, uh, a Lenovo notebook or whatever, they, or Office Pad, whatever they, those things are called. You can get one of those things for under £500 if you want to, right? They might not be the most high-performing uh, pieces of tech out there, but you can get a laptop for that kind of price. So... Um, it's surprising to me that with so many options on the laptop PC landscape, that tablets are still this are still as popular as they are because they're not as cheap. They're not super cheap, right? It's not like they're 150 quid. Like, how much is an iPad Pro going to cost you? <coughs> Under 300, right? You can still get. Which be, maybe that's true, isn't it? If an iPad Pro is going to cost you under 300 quid, and you can make phone calls with it, and you can use it as like a main kind of um, uh, your main computer then maybe it kind of works, right? Because most people don't really need any extra fucking utilities to plug into them. They don't need memory cards or USB cables. They just want to browse the internet, right, for the most part. Buy, download stuff off Spotify, buy stuff on iTunes. Like, anyway, I guess some of you are mostly color based But again, I don't, again, me not understand what's going on, but let's watch this video and see if we kind of get a grip of what's happening. It's a video from um, a story from from The Verge, right? So it says in the article here, um, we're all at the beginning of the beginning of the foldable smartphone era. Uh, da, 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 let's zoom this a bit. As you might be able to tell from the explosion of hype surrounding these sci-fi devices. Are they sci-fi though? Ah, uh, okay, maybe from like Star Trek, right? Because I'm watching stuff. You watching Star Trek Discovery? If not, please check it out. It's on um, Netflix. It's a little bit. There's look. There's there are some agendas going on there, right? You can only have to watch it to kind of figure out what the kind of you know um what kind of a uh, political stance they're taking with it. But just take that away. It's a fucking brilliant show. And again, it makes you want to dream. Do you remember when you were younger and you used to like dream about flying cars, right, and about teleporting? Um, and I don't know, phases and shit. It makes you want to dream because nowadays, you know, technology isn't advancing as fast as you probably want it to. Especially big breakthroughs, right? Um, electric scooters have just been, have just been, have just become a thing recently. Um, uh, we we mostly have, you know, we have we have every invention under the sun when it comes to apps, but we don't have more inventions when it comes to automobile design, right? It's all kind of the same sort of thing still, um, which is a bit disheartening. But if you watch Star Trek Discovery on netflix now it really will um make you dream but anyway um the article says it continues that i look uh, i look at the excitement coming from manufacturers mobile cameras mobile carriers eager tech enthusiasts and i see tremendous and almost universal energy and demand for a category to become a significant part of our shared technological future which is uh, i'm not i don't know it might just be a thing for geeks you know i don't think the average guy on the road wants a bigger a bigger smartphone that they can fold it's like hmm in the past the markets um, waited for Apple to popularize new product category, which is true, uh, as it did with the iPad for the tablets. But now um, the rest of the tech industry is forging ahead. Patience, um, patience is low. Enthusiasm is high. And judging by the Huawei Mate, Mate X unveiled yesterday, some of the, the products they make are sh- horrible names, right? The, the the Mate X. What the fuck is that? No, Mate X. Uh, design and develop are already at the advanced stage. So let's click this and see what they say from The Verge. Hey guys, we're here at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and we've just taken a look at Huawei's Mate X. It's first foldable phone, oh, a competitor Huawei. to Samsung's okay. Galaxy Huawei. Fold. And it's one of the most exciting devices we're going to see at this show. Hmm. I do say C because none of us got a chance to touch it. So let's have a look at it and I'll tell you what we know about it so far. Okay, you can't So the touch. big difference between okay. the Mate X and the Galaxy Fold is pretty obvious. The Galaxy Fold folds inwards, the screen is on the inside. Whereas with the Mate X, it wraps around the outside of the device. Interesting. When you have the screen on the inside, you have to be aware about it creasing. So you do have to have a radius on the inside of the hinge. Now, when the screen is on the outside, 
That radius is already integrated into it, so the actual device can pretty much fold flat. And that's hmm. what the Mate X does. That's not quite but cool though. In terms of holding it in your hand, when the person was looks, demoing it, 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 it just looks more. It looks, it looks a little bit like my mum's wallet when it's folded. You know, when you, you know your mums have those like long, those. Why do mums have those wallets that are just so long? Is that a thing? They never hold them in their hand. They're always just in the handbag anyway. And those wallets are like, you know, they're like fucking rectangles. They're super long. Um, I don't know if mums usually have bigger notes or whatever, but or they don't like folding their notes. Why is that? Why do women always have those what purses that I just... But it reminds me a little bit of my mum's wallet. So I'm sure my mum will like it. And it also reminds me of like that thing that you see old ladies and old guys wear um, when they're carrying the iPhone. That flick thing where they're like flicking open and like, you know, looking at it like, um, I don't know, like it's a book or something. So maybe it might work for an older demographic. I, don't, I just don't, I just don't, I just can't imagine sixteen year old kids wanting the foldable smartphone, but maybe that doesn't matter, right? Uh, maybe if you're making these things, you're kind of want your the main intention is to make sure the whole populace kind of um, buys it. But I just can't imagine like a sixteen year old kid that's on Snapchat wanting a foldable smartphone, especially that big. Well, natural, it looks also a more robust and durable device. Huawei's demo person, he held it pretty much within reach of myself so I could see it up close, he handled it super casually. It wasn't like one of those super fragile prototypes where you're tenderly opening and closing it. It almost feels like an expanded smartphone. You hmm. really stretched out a smartphone and then you decided, you know what, we'll just fold it. Um, so to me that says we're talking about a device that is really much closer to a retail product than pretty much any other foldable device we've seen. Hopefully at some point during MWC, somebody will let me touch it so I can speak about how it feels and whether it's as light as it looks. And that's the other thing with the Mate X, it's super thin. Hmm. It's got a 5.4 millimeters of thickness across most of the device, okay. and then it has a little bump, which I consider pretty much a grip. Uh, which makes it 11 millimeters and that grip also integrates all the cameras It has a USB-C charging port, which also uh, brings to mind. There's no headphone jack as far as I've seen No headphone jack it matches the Galaxy Fold uh, Imagine right imagine imagine one in a foldable smartphone and then complaining you're not getting a headphone jack Some tech nodes are fucking annoying in it, right? You want technological you want some technological advances, right? You want to you want to fucking I don't know what even that that screen is is it OLED? Plasma, I don't know what fucking f f um, screen that is that allows us to fold, right? Whatever, how much work they have to do to make a screen that can fold is fucking insane. But then you want them to put a fucking headphone jack in there. Come on, man. Like, God almighty. <laughs> um, what can we do? The future has no headphone jacks in it, apparently. Anyway, that's not the important thing. The important thing is how the thing functions. You have an 8-inch display when the tablet is fully open. And when you close it up, you have a 6.6-inch... Pretty much a regular smartphone on the main display and then you have a 6.4 inch really tall display on the back because that's sitting right next to the grip for the camera stuff. Then you have the rear one which helps you with taking selfies with the main camera. Uh, if you want to take a photo of somebody and you want them to see you taking their photo, you can do that. You have mirror screen mm. mirroring and then again you have the 8 inch tablet which is almost a square. It's an 8 by 7.1 aspect ratio. I don't know why Huawei couldn't just make it a little bit wider and give us a perfect square. That would have been just the magical Instagram device. So Huawei's keeping quite a few of the specs under wraps for now, but I'll tell you what we do now. Firstly, the processor inside is the Kirin 980. Okay, all the tech stuff I don't give a shit about. But yeah, anyway, um, cool, man. Um, foldable smartphones. I don't know why you'd want a, 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 a square smartphone that's exactly the sort of dimensions of the Instagram feed when Instagram would just turn around and just change it and it won't be 10, 1080 by 1080 anymore. It's a little bit dumb. Um, but yeah, in general, people want foldable smartphones. I don't know why. Um, I generally want smartphones that I can fit inside my pockets, that I can put into small bags. I don't want to carry around loads of shit. I've lived my life carrying around loads of shit. I've lived my life carrying around fucking books. You can see I'm surrounded by and other, you know, random shit I have in my backpack. The last thing I want is another big fucking gadget just for the sake of it. Um, but again, maybe I'm in the minority there. Uh, but yeah, I guess you should check that out. I'm not sure when that's going to come out. No real details regarding it, but people want foldable smartphones, it seems. Um, what's next on the list here? Uh, bah, 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 bah. Scroll down. Oh, we have Pleasure Spring 2019 collection. Um, Lookbook here. 
for those of you that are interested in pleasures and um, pleasures is one of those brand i think they're la based right for the most part i'm pretty sure they're la based um i was in contact with pleasures back in the day when i used to work for a certain company I had to do a, a little streetwear course and i got talking to some of the guys out there um and um he was very um the guy that does it, i think his name's alex i'm pretty sure is it alex or something like that right um he was very protective of his image and the association of pleasures and he was very hesitant on ma- on being associated with somebody um, beginning with V and um, which kind of made me laugh at the time um just for optics why not because i think he's shit but just for optics right it just made me laugh that there were people in la that were not really convinced about all the fluff and all the smoke and mirrors that was happening in the fashion world and didn't necessarily think it'd be a good idea to have their brand associated with uh, the w- with this um, unnamed guy, which you know, for some people has kind of fared great, some people has kind of fared the worst. Um, it's interesting now to see um, the people that was the people that said no at the time when I asked them. Now you know they're around him sucking his dick, you know, like being fucking male groupies um, because you know they are they're aware of how important he is and that the fact that they have to kind of stand next to him to get a bit of the rub. And in order for them then to kind of progress upwards, um, I'm not somebody that's cut from that cloth. I have morals. And if I generally just don't like somebody or I just generally think what that person's doing is shit, I'm not going to stand by them, stand next to them just so I can get a bit of a rub and kind of uh, by proxy, um, you know, get myself position where I want to be. Because I wouldn't be able to sleep at night, you know, knowing that I kind of sold myself out um just so i can um attend a show go to a party um get cd some free shoes it's, it's just not worth it i think in general but you know again these streetwear guys have a different way of thinking they're a little some of them are a bit weird and you know in general streetwear is a lot like the comedy circuit right it's just full of you know adult kids really you know um no one's really growing up um everyone's wearing ridiculous clothes for the most part right um i don't think there's any age appropriate wearing 40 year old in streetwear for the most part outside of maybe chris gibbs or something right Everyone kind of looks a little bit like a clown, so um, I guess it is to be it's to be expected that people would act a little bit clownish. But um, this Alice guy seems pretty cool, and I like what he's doing at Pleasures. Um, again, I'm a big fan of just people that just do streetwear and just do that really well, and don't try and flirt with the whole fashion thing, or don't try and get too heady, or don't try for you know um, no pun intended, um, and just because I think there's so much scope in streetwear as it is anyway. I know it's just you know standard cap hoodie t-shirt jeans and trainers but i think there's a lot of room to kind of really play and to really get adventurous and to really fucking push the line a little bit and especially since streetwear is kind of a male dominated industry i think for the most part there's a lot of there's a lot of play and a lot of um stuff that you can do that's quite interesting in terms of how you play with the idea of masculinity and i think pleasures do a really good way of doing it and kind of imbuing some really weirdo um arty farty cultural stuff influences that you know are gonna maybe go over most people's heads but for the most part they're a real um cool antidote to the kind of vapid shit you see on the market right now um so they've got spring 2019 collection lookbook now um available the collection is called love is not enough um i've got the collection up here on the screen so it's on hype beast but if you want to check it out you should google it um so here we go let's scan for the images oh come on these slideshows are annoying aren't they um anyway let's go there so, so here you got ni- nice jackets here um you got a jacket here with i'm a fret to the system um with the x-ray of someone's hand i wonder who the hand is okay little bucket hat sweatpants um i don't know if the lady that's on the left here is wearing pleasure pants here which they look really cool i'm hoping they are if they are that they look really awesome <clears throat> it's all like combat pants with like a massive um zip on one side on the right leg that kind of goes around the top they look really cool um you've got a nice bucket hats there is that a chain that might be pleasures too i'm not again i'm not too sure because some streetwear brands they, that's where it can get a bit annoying they can sometimes style shoots and just get them let the model wear whatever they want to wear right um their own kind of bits and pieces are so you look at the credits and be like oh the chain is models and models own um that can be a bit annoying but sometimes it could just be, and it's also, sometimes it's also a good platform to kind of introduce some new products that they're trying to thinking of um releasing in the future um great long sleeve again nice nice sweatpants um great hoodies um Again, t-shirts um they've got nice floral print shirts i think a few brands have been doing a few of these uh pattern shirts um in the vein of something that you might see a jeff gold goobloom gold bloom wearing right jeff goldblum yeah <laughs> 
Um, let's go in here again. Some great shorts that are, I'm sure are gonna be popular during festival season. Color block shorts, um, really classic. Can't really go wrong with them, especially if you're a dude, you know, and you wanna attend a festival and wear your nice, expensive trainers. You know, might as well flex on the shorts. Again, this girl here has got a nice top on. Is there a coach jacket or is that a shirt? I'm not too sure. It's got like polygon squares all over it. it looks really cool. Again, a nice bag that she's wearing here with a massive zip. Look at the size of that zip. That's what you call chunky zips. Um, there was a thing when that's when Riri were making great zips, right? Um, they were really nice chunky ones. But sometimes you do get some brands that do make great plastic chunky zips, like oversized um, looking zips. Something that you might see some a zip that I kind of would imagine seeing on like an Astrid Anderson bag. You remember her? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if she's still around though, actually. Um, and here another one too. Great T-shirt too. What's that say? Is it House of Sufferance Pleasures? Again, nice pants. Oh, they've got some trainers here. There's Air Force One collaborations or somebody else. Might be their own in like... Oh, I think it might be the Adidas, right? I think they did a collaboration with Adidas before. I think it might be a pair of Sambas that they just plus and pledges on the side of it. Which, again, not for me personally. They kind of remind me a little bit of what Undercover do when they have their collaborations. They'll just slap Undercover on the side of it, which I'm not really a big fan of. Again, maybe it's just you had their way of using the, the logo. So, because they don't really have an actual logo, you use the text, but, you know, not for me. A great little long sleeve here half zip shirts which i'm seeing a lot of i think supreme had a couple of them as well look a little bit too grandaddy for my liking but again what do i know some great shorts there nice tops oh i like that t-shirt tv party pleasures i really like that one um the glasses look cool that that fleece is it half zip that fleece looks fucking awesome i like that there nice sunglasses as well i'm hoping the chain is by pleasures this chain looks awesome i'm hoping it is hoping they made this chain I'm not sure what that link is called. Is, is that the same link that I have? The snake link? Is it snake or whatever? I don't know what it's called. Uh, the link of the um, the actual chain um, on the necklace. And it's got two little O-rings there. I'm not sure if there's a hat. If those are meant to be cufflings or a bondage thing. But again, really good, cool, really cool stuff all, all over from Pleasures. Highly recommend you check them out. Um, again, one of my one of my favorite brands out there at the moment doing really cool things on the streetwear sheen without selling out to the fashion industry. Is it selling out or is it probably not selling out? Is it? it's a bit OTT to say that, but hey. Um, what else is next here? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Uh, Trigger T. Oh, okay. So this kid, right? Have you heard? It? So um, obviously, um, you know. Um, drills being de drills getting demonized by the media in general, right? They they've decided that drills become the um, you know the thing that they the de facto thing that they're going to rally against. For the most part, drill does have its uh, bad points in it, but you know there is a there's probably more to the there's probably more to the story of drills prominence than it than kind of meets the eye, right? It's not just the an exercise of unnecessary violence and excess from these kids, right? There's obviously a reason why most of these kids are feeling like they have to, you know, um, live this way of life because it's a very peculiar problem because I think it happened um, in the kind of early years when, um, you know, some of the South, some of the South crews were coming up like SN1 and Rosa G's. There was like a fit. There was like a feeling that there was a bit of a tide shift where there was, um, there was, there was kind of like a trend or not. What, you saw a trend. There was a upsurge in MCs coming up who were trying to let everyone know that they were really about this life, right? Everything they rapped about, they were trying to let everyone know that I really do this, right? Whether it meant, you know, getting into public fights, whether it meant busting their gun, whether it meant stabbing people, they wanted everyone to know um, that they really lived their raps, right? Um, and it kind of was a bit of a shift in culture because I remember before that, if you listen, if you think about More Fire Crew, you think about Boy Better No, uh, you know, probably not even them, you think about Roll Deep Crew, um, you never really associated them with violence, right? You just associate them with just being really good MCs, right? And, you know, going on radio sets, just absolutely murking. Um, but then it kind of changed. And then, of course, you know, with the lack of jobs in some of these areas, especially in parts of East London that I'm from, especially my borough in Newham, which is one of the poorest boroughs in the, I think in the UK, last time I checked. Um, and with the cut, with them cutting all of the fund, well, most of the funding with some of the youth centres, I spent a lot of my time in youth centres, right? When I was coming up um, or when I was just in the ends, um, most of my time was spent in youth centres, um, whether it was kind of seeing grime artists with poor form. I remember I, the first time I saw Griminal MC was at a youth centre in Canning Town, um, whether it was kind of playing football in tournaments, whether it was going to like quote-unquote summer schools that meant to keep kids busy and keep them off the streets. So, um, 
you said as well the kind of bedrock the kind of glue that held the, the little community together um some of the people some of the teachers out in those kind of um community centers um, for the most part, for some of the kids, they acted as their second dads, right? Uh, second mothers, right? Um, because they didn't have families or because their parents were off on drugs. So they were really important places for people to kind of hang out and congregate. And the fact that they've all kind of, you know, gone away um, is no coincidence that nowadays you're seeing all these kids that don't really have that much to do hang around Stratford's shopping centre, um, either looking to pick up girls or looking to, you know, attract male, or male mates or looking to start fights. It's no coincidence that this stuff is happening because... There's nothing else really to do. Um, so the demonization of drill is a little bit hard to take because it seems like they're, again, as most things in life, as most things when it comes pertaining to the media, instead of looking at the actual cause, just look, instead of actually looking at the cause that led to what's happening, they just look at the final result. And all of a sudden, they just demonize whoever is doing it. And unfortunately, the people that are doing it mostly, especially when it comes to drills, are black and brown people. So it's easy to kind of demonize those. But um, this story uh, regarding uh, this drill rapper called uh, Daniel Ola, 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 Ola Loku, right? Daniel Loku, I'm assuming he's Nigerian, is intriguing because... Um, it, it surmises that he was you know he was a drill rapper um a, a rapper in general called trigger t who i'm not really familiar with but what makes the story interesting was that supposedly he was trapping along county lines and he was trapping in his university dorm right in his university that's like some epic shit so supposedly the story goes that he was transporting um illegal drugs class a drugs from london up to wherever he was in um studying for university um it was in uh barrow in ferns in cumbria um the t the teenager was a member of a silwood nation group Sil uh, silwood nation drill group that's a weird name for a rap group but silwood nation he was a pharmacology student and previously auditioned to, uh, on itv's x factor bro what was he doing singing who I mean, Imagine getting on stage and trying to do drill rap in front of Simon Cow. Like, you know what I mean? That would be so weird, no? <laughs> they wouldn't get what was going on, no? Could you even have an instrumental playing, right? Could you? Probably could, right? I'm assuming. Because doing drill a cappella sounds fucking nuts. Um, anyway, uh, blah, 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 blah. Peter Adebayo, his friend, I'm assuming, 19, also received seven years in prison. Um, and made the two charges the drill uh, anyway let's forget that skip that a local who studied at the university of central lancashire in preston um was arrested in a town raid in his at his halls in residence in april so imagine imagine you're trapping out of your fucking hall bedroom that's fucking nuts isn't it i guess it's true because there was this thing i saw the other day this kid in america made this app um where people could buy drugs on where it was only kind of a needs to know basis on so no one knew it was kind of looked like a game but it was actually an app to buy drugs from um, so I guess kids are doing it nowadays because again it's a per it's a perfect catchment area. To me, it sounds fucking nuts, right? Trapping in a university dorm room, um, but it sounds like the perfect catchment area, right? Because you've got loads of kids for the most part who sometimes have disposable income, not all the time because you know student loan runs out really quickly, and then you also have an, a a new clientele, right? Um, that you, that haven't been maybe exposed to a level of drugs that you're kind of bringing in with that kind of frequency, especially borough and furnace, right? I'm not sure how many trap houses they actually have there, but I will assume it's that many. Um, da, 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 da. When police searched his room, they found a sword, knives, four cheap mobile phones, wraps of heroin and crack cocaine and £480 in cash. There was also a Silwood Nation t-shirt. <laughs> Oh, these fucking kids, man. Um, and earlier hearing, the 19-year-old who grew up in Deptford and Bermondsey in South London gave his address um, as the management suite at the halls of the residence. In a simultaneous raid in April at an address in Manchester, police arrested Ali Bayer. Um, searching his room, officers found mobile phones to sell drugs. Um, Ali Bayer pleaded guilty to two charges conspiring to supply drugs in Barrow and also sentenced to seven years of prison. Uh, between December and April, at least 12 people died, which this is the saddest thing about it, though. Was a suspected drug overdose in the town, which was a population of six, 67,000. So they're they're basically trying to pin the deaths on people of people in that town with this uh, with the uh, appearance of this kid um, selling his um, super cut drug material to these fucking um, unsuspecting victims. Which is you know again, which is that's the sad part of it. I think for the most part, um, and it's a, it's a crazy story, really. If you think about it, right? Kids chopping out the university dorm room. But again, let's look at the issue. Why are kids number one wanting to you know, stab their rivals that live across the street because they've got the wrong postcode. Why are they also going to university, a place where they should be trying to further their lives, trying, you know, get themselves, um, um, you know, path, uh, 
make a path for their life that you know is divergent on whatever culture they've kind of been brought up with right they're trying to find a way out from the ghetto by going to fucking um university but then they get there and end up trapping why is it happening might have might have to do some might it, it, it might have something to do with the rising cost of tuition fees we have something to do with the fact that most kids are, i think you can't get a bursary anymore right that loan that you used to be able to get they don't have to pay back right um the fact that student loans for the most part are used to fund your everyday day-to-day life and not to allow you to like not have to work and to kind of focus on studying which is what they're kind of there for that might be the reason the fact that it's hard to get a job when you're in university and you have no experience because no one wants to hire you and the fact that you can only work 16 hours a week no one wants to fucking have that hassle on top of them the fact that zero zero hour contracts are not really the in thing anymore but for some people especially if you're working in a university especially if you're at university story enrolled it might be beneficial to be in a zero hour contract where you can kind of pop in pop out if need be there's loads of things that add to the fact that these kids are where they are now, but no one wants to talk about it. Everyone just wants to see the fucking, the headline of like, oh, these drill rappers are around doing this fucking nonsense. There's more to the story. There definitely is more to the story. We know this. It's not normal for a kid to go to university and be trapping. And all of a sudden, his drugs lead to the deaths of 12 people, which again, I'm not really sure that's even true, to be honest. And it's really unfair to kind of ascribe that to him, unless the, through the toxicology reports of the people that died, they were able to kind of trace the amounts of They'd be able to trace the substances that were in their bodies to the stuff that he was selling. But again, it's just a fucking bizarre situation. And again, something that kind of highlights what's kind of going on. There's a video here of him kind of getting searched in his dorm room and whilst he's sleeping. That's a bit distressing, which I'm not really a fan of watching. But yeah, um, I guess... I guess read the article if you want. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise it because it might bum you out a little bit. But yeah, it's sad to see these kids in a situation that they're in now where they're having to resort to these crazy things again maybe it's something you actually wanted to do uh, i'm not too sure i don't know the guy um but again um, a sad situation all around for those involved for the ones that passed um for the university too it's fucking embarrassing right having these kids in your halls and trapping and you had no idea what was going on um again crazy situation to go in and you know lends it lends more credence to the idea that maybe we should we should just fucking legalize these fucking drugs so they're not in the hands of you know um shady characters who are gonna cut them and you know not sell them in their pure form and then have people die of overdoses right or maybe not have safe areas that people can um, partake in these things maybe we should be in there but I, I don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know what else is going on here da, 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 da. let me think of else i want to talk about um let's move around here Bum, 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 bum. What's I got here on the list? Oh, Tommy Tom Fashion Collection. This looks fucking awesome, man. I'm gonna get this up on the big screen and make this bigger, actually. So, um, Tommy Ton, as you guys know or you guys should be aware of, is the influential street style photographer who kind of burst onto the scenes um, when the whole um, era of people being infatuated with the editors of magazines was kind of bursting up. Do you remember that? That was kind of maybe the early 2000s, maybe, or just after the early 2000s. Um, nowadays, it's not so much a thing now anymore, right? People, for the most part, have kind of reverted back to following celebrities. But there was a period in time where most fashion enthusiasts were kind of infatuated with what Emanuela Alt, what Geraldine Saglio, what all those kind of people were wearing, um, um, what they were kind of wearing on the streets, um, you know, this uh, Scott Schumann, Scott Schumann, Schumann, how you pronounce his name, the Sartorius, he was kind of coming up during that time too. And um, Tommy Tom was kind of the one that was able to capture the kind of magic that was going on around fashion shows, right? Especially during when people are um, entering and exiting. And um, for me, having been to fashion shows a couple of times now, um, I was somebody that was kind of, you know, I was kind of poo-pooing the whole energy about it and the ambience. But once you go to a fashion show, especially if you love fashion and you're actually interested about, the, you're interested in the designers and in the culture that surrounds it, attending a fashion show is quite, um, it's quite a revolutionary experience. It really does kind of catch you off guard, just how much energy and goodwill and kind of just love and appreciation for this fucking weird niche that we're all kind of obsessed about is a is kind of about because i think for the most part take us all away from those fashion shows we all i think for the most part fashion enthusiasts we're all freaks amongst our friends right we're not we're yeah we're freaks amongst our friends people people really think that we're weird right we think the different clothes that we wear are strange but then when you go to a fashion show you're generally part of the crowd you're part of your you're one of every 
you're one of a hundred people, right? You f- you suddenly feel like you've got a community. You suddenly feel like you've got some camaraderie around you. You suddenly feel like no one's going to be taking a piss out of the, the pants or the trousers you decide to wear that day. And Tommy Tom was able to kind of capture that magic in a really organic way, like without having people pose and just capture them in kind of motion. And um, it seems like over time, he's kind of pulled back a little bit from the whole street style thing. Um, now, uh, Phil O takes over from doing the Vogue um, street style stuff. Tommy Tom sometimes a few, does a few stuff for his, um, on Instagram. But I, I guess in the time that he's been away, he was slowly um, concocting this collection of clothes uh, called The View or The Vaux, right? That he's put together. He debuted, um, I'm going, is it Paris Fashion Week or is that New York? I think it might be New York, um, New York Fashion Week. That looks fucking incredible. And again, I think it kind of lends itself a little bit to what's going on at the moment. There's a few brands happening now um, called Wardrobe NYC, I remember, and another one too that are trying to uh, capture the war, trying to capture the kind of... Um, we see the staple fashion market, right? The, the 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 people that like fashion, I want to buy staples because I think when you start getting into fashion and you start, you know, following certain brands, you start to realize that there are some brands that you can buy into. Um, how do I say this? You start to realize that your wardrobe needs class staple pieces, right? Whether it's a trench coat, whether it's a hoodie, whether it's a perfect pair of tapered pants whether it's a blazer, whether it's a cardigan, there's certain things that you need in your wardrobe, right? Um, that you don't necessarily kind of get from the kind of, you know, the, the luxury brands out there. So um, sometimes um, these these kind of collect, these kind of staple collection brands, whatever they may be, however you term them, are a good answer to it because they make high quality items that you can kind of, you know, easily rotate um, between your outfits and you can mix and match with different sort of brands. And um, Tommy Tons decided to do the same sort of thing with the stuff that he's done, right? And it's called Devo, right? I'm going to get up on your screen. And again, it's a very classic, classy collection. Um, they debuted it, I'm pretty sure, at New York Fashion Week, a very interesting way to debut it. It was kind of done in like a presentation style in a big room um, where the kind of uh, models were kind of walking in and amongst each other, intermingling inside the, inside the space. And um, it's quite similar to what the stuff that um, Tommy Ton shoots on street style. So people within their natural elements wearing stuff they'd probably be wearing outside of it, outside of um, the actual show itself. There were couples, there were families, mother and daughters. Um, it was just a really nice mix of people um the casting was brilliant of course um because most of it i'm assuming was street casted or was pe- friends and family associated with tommy ton and i just think in general this collection was just a very very beautiful collection i'm gonna get it up on your screen so everyone can see um, let me make this thing a little bit bigger here blah, 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 blah. yeah i just think it was a very beautiful collection overall so this is it and um, it's called the vo um 28 looks it looks like for the most part um, and again, just nice classic pieces, you know, like, like great blazers, great pants here that you can see on this look number two. Um, um, I see this scarf detail that we saw um, debuted at the Dior show, right? This sort of like scarf tucked inside the jacket, right? You saw that, right? We saw the little bit of style detail in the Dior show. I think someone mentioned at the Dior show that supposedly it was quite easy to clip on and clip out. It wasn't, it was like a bit of a, um, it wasn't as, it didn't look as difficult as it looked on, on the fashion show. I think in the fashion show it looked like the silk sort of scarf like cut, tucked into the blazer and it went over the top and then wrapped around again um, but it's a nice little styling trick that looks like a few brands have kind of taken inspiration from the Dior show of again um nice you know you know hound's tooth sort of like overcoats that most people could wear again staple pieces jumpsuits you know done really well with nice overcoats um i'm assuming the shoes and loafers are a great look as well a part of the collection they look really nice like penny loafers that you could easily wear with most outfits again great clo- oh okay they got the shop to look so i'm guessing there's a collaboration um, or there's a tie-in involved with, is it Modo Operandi? So you can actually shop the looks on Vogue.com as well if you want to check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes for you guys to see. Again, great staple pieces. It looks like a nice silk um, pajama garment. Again, great little shawls and scarves over. I think look number eight is probably my favorite. A great, it looks like, is it tweed? We say tweed or maybe not tweed. Maybe it's wool overcoat, um, no button, just like a belt around the front, which reminds you of like some of the looks you might see some of the Italian guys wearing during Petit Umo. Again, great trousers. Everything is cut really well to the trousers, so they show off the loafers straight away. Um, if they're not rolled up, they're cut really well. Again, great, great cardigans, great blazers, great pants. Um, the color combinations work really well, burnt orange. Um, overcoat here or brown would you call it? I'm not too sure. 
scarf details look really cool great blazers again great suit jackets and again just a really cool interesting concept to take like fashion in this mold right you want to wear these clothes but you don't necessarily want to wear them in a high fashion way um you want to have these staples that you can kind of again that are fairly you know um, well priced that you can then kind of buy yourself um again i wonder how much actually this collection is um again re nice rain jacket that looks really cool um i like all of it i'm a big 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 fan of it i recommend you check it out and again the things you're interested to see like tommy Turner, street star photographer has now kind of um crept into the fashion space and i guess for me it'll be interesting to see oh this 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 suit looks awesome um it's interesting to see what happens or what's the reaction like um in within the fashion glitterati because uh, there he is the main man tommy ton because it seemed like um you know you get the impression that you know with all the stuff that you know, would the stick that someone like a Virgil or Matthew Williams or people like those get when they come into fashion, it seems like a lot of it, you know, is quite tinged with a little bit of racism, it seems like, right? It, I would say so, because if you if you allow, if, if, not if you allow, if you don't get your pants in a twist about um, Tommy Tom making clothes, then why are you getting to your pants in a twist about Virgil making clothes, right? Because Tommy Tom has, doesn't have, a, that. what, did he study fashion? I don't think he did. Um, he might have, maybe when he was in college, but for the most part, he spent the last, I don't know, decade or so taking some of the most influential street star pictures outside of shows. He's learned his trade from being out on the street and actually seeing what people want to wear instead of pontificating about um, what people want. And, you know, because you see these things happen a lot, especially on show studio panels, right, where they kind of bicker about um, collections that they would never wear or they would never purchase, right? They don't necessarily wear the luxury items that they talk about but then they have so many so many opinions about what people on the street want to wear and it's like no you don't know though you don't actually talk to people on the street you're not actually there you not. you think you're above it um, and i think for tommy ton i think maybe which again is really weird to say maybe all those years spent outside of shows not being actually in the show because for the most part we just stand outside and take pictures of people on the outside right during um trade shows during fashion shows has really kind of informed um his aesthetic and really made him understand and really appreciate what people actually want and there's a maybe a level of humility involved there that you wouldn't necessarily see um with some of the fashion professionals because again he's come from the outside right he was a geek just like me and you um or like anyone else that love fashion and he kind of suddenly was propelled onto this platform where he was kind of given the chance to kind of um you know be one of the the flag bearers be one of the forerunners when it came to taking pictures of people outside and you know and for the most part that's maybe led to some commission work and led to other things but now he's kind of you know segued into the designing clothes which is to see how the fashion industry treats him as opposed to how they treat some of the other people that have come in and haven't had the quote-unquote quintessential fashion education I know what the reaction is going to be like. I'm sure they're going to just allow him and not really, you know, be too fussed about it. But, you know, so it's definitely a little bit of a sour taste in the mouth, to be honest. Like, come on, guys. I mean, you can't be one way with one person and then maybe the other way with the other person. But again, what do I know? But I'm happy in general for Tommy Tone. I think um, it's great to see. I, I, I bumped into him a couple of times when I was outside of shows. And he was always quite personable, really nice dude. Um, and I just, you know, happy to see that, you know, there's this shift happening where people are going from being casual observers into kind of being active cultural participants, right? Um, I, I go back to the quote from Aaron Bondroff about leaving your mark on the cultural timeline of wherever you are, New York, London, or just the fashion scape of rural, right? You want to have your little mark that you want to leave it because, you know, like, you know, we all pass in this world. Um, nothing is promised except death itself. So if we're going to make the most of the life that we've got, we should chase the passions that we have that we're interested with and we should try to contribute something to it, everything that's given to us, right? fashion's given a lot to me it's introduced me to a lot of people it's introduced me to a lot of cultures it's introduced me to a lot of different experiences and i'd only want to give something back to it um, in the hope that though those coming after me will somehow gain inspiration from the little little thing that i've done and kind of again pay it forward pay it forward pay it forward pay it forward again um i recommend you check it out devo it's spelled what is spelled d-e-v d-e-v-e um aux um i think you can shop the looks on a motor operandi is saying supposedly right let me see if i can shop this looks let me see if i can go and check out if i can shop that look i saw with a guy with a suit um motor, so motor operandi is selling at the moment which is you know not the most cheapest store in the world know, but let's see what they say here motor operandi come on skin 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 okay let's see this look can you shop it shop the look it says when you click here okay yeah you can so um if you go on vogue.com you can shop the look itself directly via modera parandi i'm not sure if they're doing it for all the things maybe they are um if it kind of loads kind of hurry up i wish it was direct to consumer though i'm pretty sure it, it must be right if you're tommy ton you're you know 
you're that guy. You must be able to make it kind of direct to consumer, so I don't have to kind of go on these things. And plus, Mother of Brandy's women's as well. I just realized, but anyway, let's click a look and see how much anything is just to kind of get a grip on the idea. But yeah, again, um, this kind of long coat is like five nine hundred dollars, right? I've got it here up on your screen, which again, I'm assuming isn't that bad of a price for the most for the most part. Um, I don't know what women would usually want to pay for an item such as this but um this is the utility oversized belted garbadine coat um 900 quid this is it on the show that i showed you before fairly nice jacket that you can kind of wear again quite a versatile piece and especially with the belt when it's belted but yeah recommend you check that out um tommy ton uh new collection anyway um that is it for me and the actual thing show so it's a little short one because i've got zip nip 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 out um again thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have the company of your ears um as always for anything concerning me in terms of my dj gigs check out my website snozinga.com dj gigs on the top i've got a couple gigs next week that should be listed on there um anything else regarding my youtube channel podcast subscription blog you can find it on there too uh, blogs at defaultgoon.com and um, if you're watching on youtube give me a like give me a subscribe share and all that malarkey and until then, or until tomorrow, actually, I'll see you guys again. Take care, hold on tight, and stay. keep yourself well hydrated like I am, right? Keep yourself well hydrated, and I'll see you guys again very soon. Peace out.